Make the choice to begin anywhere in your life, and the journey has started. And along the way, be inspired. Listen to the stories by joining the president of Howard University, Dr. Wayne A.I. Frederick, on the journey. Howard University Hospital and the College of Medicine have a long history of serving the community and transforming the way healthcare is delivered to African American men and women by educating, training, and developing black physicians. This legacy has been strengthened throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, when the hospital and college continue to provide vital services during a devastating crisis and challenging circumstances. Hello, my name is Dr. Wayne Frederick, and my guest today on The Journey is Dr. Hugh Mighty, Howard's new Senior Vice President of Health Affairs and the outgoing Dean of the College of Medicine and Vice President of Clinical Affairs. So Dr. Mighty, welcome to The Journey. Thank you, sir. My pleasure to be here. So I know we've spoken to you before about things in the College of Medicine and your own career. What I want to spend some time today with uh, would be reminding our audience about some of that, but really spending time on looking forward. So we, first, let's start looking back just a, a bit. You were born and raised in Jamaica, my favorite place to holiday. I hope my um, <laughs> listeners from Trinidad and Tobago don't get upset um, about that. But what part of Jamaica uh, were you born and raised? Bo born in um, Kingston. Um, but spent most of my time in uh, Port Antonio. Oh, okay, so. excellent. And, w and uh, how did you end up migrating to the U.S.? Oh, geez, my mother. Okay. <laughs> my mother's long, <laughs> long story, but yeah, my mother uh, migrated to the U.S. for opportunities, mm -hmm. and then finally I was able to follow her, and Faith and Circles actually came around because she worked in New York for the longest time. I came here, moved to, went to undergraduate college at Georgetown, Okay. She actually lost her job in New York. We moved, she moved down here so we could find a job. She looked for a job for a year, and of all the places she ended up, actually was at Howard University. Oh, you can was here for wow. 16 years, so yes. Oh, excellent, excellent. And what area did she work in? She was in human resources. Okay, excellent. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's excellent. I didn't know that. And so after Georgetown undergrad, um, where did you attend medical school? I, I went to the University of Maryland up okay. in Baltimore, spent my time there, um, graduated from there, did my residency training actually in OBGYN at the University of Maryland, then went and spent three years with public health service in an underserved community in Pimlico up in uh, Baltimore. Right. Um, got um, interested in high-risk obstetrics because of the number of teenage pregnancies we saw at the time and the number of sick patients we took care of and someone suggested to me if you're going to do this you should just make a career of it so went back to Maryland did a fellowship in high-risk obstetrics and in the middle of that fellowship someone says if you're really going to do this you really should learn some more so I did a critical care fellowship as well okay. in the shock drama center so I combined those two and became a critical care obstetrician which is somewhat of a, yeah. a rare bird but that's, yeah that's, that's what extremely, we did. That's extremely rare. What about um, OBGYN attracted you? Um, you know, there, there are two things about it that, that really I thought were, were good. One is community. It's primary care. I wanted to take care of patients longitudinally. So as I said, I wanted to sort of grow old with the patients. And so it was one of the few specialties that d does that. The second one was just my own interest in surgery. So I wanted to do primary care, wanted to take care of patients, but I also love to operate. So I wanted to kind of mm -hmm. combine both. And there are only, I think, three specialties that actually do that. So OBGYN being one of them was where I, I ended up. Okay, excellent. And obviously, um, you spent some time at the University of Maryland um, in that department. I believe you ended up chairing the department. Um, what was that experience like, and how did that prepare you for some of your future roles? Uh, you know, it's it's... I wasn't expecting to be a chair. I didn't start out thinking that I, I was ever going to be a chair. I was, I was really engaged in delivering care at first hand. And I had a, a mentor there, and one day we were out running, and he said to me, um, how many patients will you take care of this year that really need your help as a special, in a specialist? And I, I said, probably 100, 120. He says, imagine for a moment if you had others like you, how many do you think they could take care of? Which got my interest in trying to teach, really looking at teaching as a career mm -hmm. and managing as a career. And so from there, I was wanting to say, if I can double the number for me, they are, they'll take care of exponentially so many more patients of need. Mm -hmm. So that's how I started down that road. And mm -hmm. being able to do that sort of help prepare each step, prepared me for something else that was larger than the one I had before. And, and um, what took you away from University of Maryland? 
Um, I ended up um, spending 10 years. I went for three, and I ended up being the chair for 10 years. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had an opportunity to go to um, Louisiana. Um, and the first time I went, I, I really saw the same mission that we had when I started at Maryland. It was a lot large and extremely large. I worked in the public health system for Louisiana and the LSU, Louisiana State University in Shreveport, had a very large underserved population and a chance to do both things, a chance to teach and a chance to deliver care for the betterment of that community. Mm -hmm. Now, while you were there, you obviously had some uh, pretty interesting experiences. Uh, what, when did you ha probably highlight one of those? What was one of the larger things you probably got involved in while you were there? <laughs> well, probably the larger thing that we hadn't planned for was a, a merger of hospitals. So mm -hmm. while I was there, the system in Louisiana had 10 public hospitals under the LSU brand banner. And they were really trying to find a way to continue to deliver care. And it was, it was difficult. As you know, it's hospitals aren't profit making and to really deliver quality care in a public system you need to have a base so we the the governor at the time sort of mandated that we go into public private partnerships and so we sought for a private group at the time i managed three of the hospitals in north louisiana and um, we had to find ways to partner with with others and that that got me into the interest again of how to continue a mission and find a partner who has a similar vision to try and get that done right so you know obviously you, you already i would say in the middle of changing your swim lanes and focusing on the new senior vp of health affairs role which obviously um would take you into a lot of strategic thirty thousand foot um type of planning what are some of the things um you know you envision uh playing in this new role and then what are those opportunities and or challenges that you think uh, you know may come with it as well so I, I think first of all the opportunity to step learning what I know about just medical school and the medical school environment Howard is unique it has all of the health sciences school and I think we're moving to a time where team-based medicine is going to be the best medicine for the future especially when dealing with underserved communities and, and I look forward to the opportunity of being able to partner with so many others and bring the specialties together so that, and, and my physician colleagues may hammer me for this, but I always say, you know, um, physicians are not the center of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's really being part of a team and there are others who can spend more time sometimes. A pharmacist can spend a lot of time managing diabetes. Mm -hmm. um, you can un manage the complications of diabetes, but a lot of times just managing diabetes, a pharmacist may be better at that. Nurses and especially advanced practice nurses are better at spending time at a patient bedside. Nurse midwives do a great job at delivering care and so forth. So being able to build that out and then involve the, <clears throat> the other corners of that, which is social work. Social work is so involved, we don't think of them as being the health care part, but they're part of the team. So the ability to do that with the following to do that and to be able to bring affordable care to underserved communities. Mm -hmm. That's really going to be the hook, is be able to, to really do that. And last but not least, I'm a geek at heart, innovation. There's yeah. so much technology now that can help us lead better lives. Again, making it affordable, being able to deliver that into communities so that we have a reach into communities as opposed to having them come to us all the time. So you, you, you mentioned, obviously, access to care and, and what underserved communities go through. The pandemic has exacerbated that. Um, and you, Sydney, have been pivotal in terms of leading the charge of the university, not just internally with testing and uh, vaccine distribution, but also in the community. What has that been like and what do you see in terms of where we are in the pandemic uh, presently? Yeah. So biggest lesson I've learned about the community, education. We often think we know how to get it there. And in the last year and a half, I've learned to really listen a lot more. Um, when recently we did a town hall with the District of Columbia's high schools and, and listening to the parents that, you know, folks says, well, people don't want to get vaccinated. It really, the question wasn't, we don't want to get vaccinated. It was, we don't know enough. And no one is talking to us as if they want, they're telling us to do it, but they're not telling us why or how to do that. So learning to listen to communities, I think, has been a big part of my journey in the last year and a half is trying to understand what do they need and how do they get there. So we've certainly participated in a lot of programs. I think the pandemic has reached an endemic stage. I think 
Omicron and the speed with which it's moving across the country is going to sort of declare us that we're going to be pandemic. And so either we're going to be vaccinated or infected, one or the other. But we will right. get to a point where we will learn to live with the virus. Um, obviously, I am a proponent of vaccinations, not even through mandates necessarily, but just sane and safe practices. We do so many other things with vaccines to protect our kids and ourselves. This really, I think, is just another one of those. And so I think it will settle down and we will come to a point where we will not do ever business as usual because the pandemic has exposed so much. Um, but we will get there. But, but let me probe on that a little bit because there's so much conversation about this becoming and, you know, be, be becoming endemic versus us having a pandemic approach. I mean, what are the two definitions that make it so different? And then even more importantly, what really is going to be different if it is endemic? Um, are people still going to be losing their lives if they're not vaccinated? And, and how are we going to still manage that? Are, are our hospitals going to still be stretched by with every variant that comes along? Right. So I, I think there are two things about it. So pandemic to me still says worldwide. Mm -hmm. and, and we can have that discussion because I think until we address the worldwide issue of those who cannot get vaccinated, we're going to have multiple variants still encroaching on us. Okay. Endemic is where we are in the country. If you get enough people vaccinated, enough people infected, I think we're going to get to the point where we basically will see the virus, people will still get infected. I think very much fewer people will die. It doesn't make the, vir the virus less virulent, so to speak, but more people will have seen it, and so you will have some immunity that is intrinsic, not just vaccine dependent. And I think annually, the virus is gonna morph the way the flu morphs, and we're gonna have to get vaccinated to keep up with it. So I think we will get to some level point with this, with this virus, but I think unless we can find a way to reach the rest of the world, so many that are not vaccinated, you're going to still see a, a, a high rate of variants that are still gonna crop up, and they're still gonna come to the shores. Yeah. And, and I guess also, when you look at being stretched, where are we at Howard University Hospital now in terms of seeing uh, patients with COVID-19? Yeah. So interestingly, you know, we've had the highest number of admissions in this wave than we had in the first wave, than the original wave. We've seen with Omicron, we've seen a lot more admissions. We've had fewer deaths, um, but we have had sick folks. What I I've seen as the response time and the ability to manage has been much improved across all levels, across our nurses, our physicians. We're more capable now. We understand more about how to do it, but we have seen a larger number of admissions in this cycle than we saw in the very first round. So are you still <clears throat> having as many patients have to go to the ICU or be on the ventilator as in the first wave as well? We have fewer total patients, but again, surprisingly, it certainly was an uptick. Once we've seen Omicron, the numbers went up. Again, data is data, and the one fact that we do know is when you end up in the ICU, when we walk through the ICU, almost every single person who gets sick with the virus who's in the ICU has been unvaccinated. So again, it's very much uh, something we have to pay attention to. It's not a passing yeah. fancy at all. And, and, and how are patients recovering compared to what you saw in the first wave? I think, again, we're managing better and we're much quicker to respond. We still have had deaths, but not nearly what we saw the first time around. So I think the management has been better because we know more we can respond. We actually have a few more tools, right? So we do have antibodies that we can administer to help, you know, abate the situation. Okay. And obviously bringing students back to campus is a key issue. Uh, it's, well, it's been well documented that the mental health um, fatigue, as it were, on students, on young people in general, not being in, in school, in person learning, um, the difficulties with accessing virtual learning, um, everybody's access to, why, to you know, internet is, is um, not um, even. So with those things in mind, um, what are some of the things you think we've been really having to grapple with uh. in order to make this successful and, and, and how is it going thus far in your opinion? So the first thing I would say about why bring people back into a campus and it's very basic. We are social beings. Mm -hmm. When we separate from each other, especially when we separate young people from each other, we don't develop very good social fabric and it's important that we do that. How we deal with each other face to face, how we interact, 
there's only so much that you can do on a television. And remote learning is a television. That's really what it is. So I think it's very important, especially for the community of students that we have. We, got, we have many students who come from underserved populations. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference in that community and this community. So that's the first thing. We, we have a challenge, obviously, because we have to keep them safe. We have to make sure that we're safe. So we follow the signs. We do all the things that we think we can do. We will not prevent every single infection. It's, it's just inevitable or not. But we can respond to every single infection that we see. And we're well equipped at Howard to do that, right? From everything from you know, our student services right up to a hospital. We have a hospital here that we can respond quickly. So I think that this is as safe an environment as you're going to find anywhere in the United States for making this happen. And I think it's just very important. So how are we doing? Well, we went from zero students to 10,000. And like everything else, we're having you know, the first week hiccups when something you turn something on, it doesn't necessarily work. But we have been responding. We have been able to test everybody who comes in for testing. And we're turning our results over. We've activated the systems we are. And as, we, as quickly as we find a gap, we're plugging the, the gaps. And, and what are the expectations around testing? So our expectations around testing is to make sure we test weekly. Again, it's important to know what that baseline is so that we can respond to it. If there's an uptick, it may signal that there's a different variant. That's basically when Omicron came about, we recognized something was different within that week when it first hit because of how many cases we suddenly saw, which we'd never seen before, especially in people who might have been vaccinated. So having that baseline informs us as to what we should expect and how we plan for the future. When the baseline falls and everyone's vaccinated and boosted, we may be able again to loosen the restrictions, but right now testing every week is our expectation. Yeah. And I recognize that we're in a surge, but the practicality of testing vaccinated students that we've also required a booster, just to push, I want to challenge uh, the, the premise for why we're, we're doing that, as well as, you know, should we be thinking about changing course? The reality is that the disease seems to be fairly self-limiting with Omicron, not as debilitating as it was with the Delta variant. So can you make the argument that maybe we should be testing unvaccinated individuals, although it's clear that our campus is close to unvaccinated individuals, but we have some exemptions so that those people should be tested. Somebody who has a, a documented exposure um, should be tested and somebody obviously with symptoms. If we were to bring those categories down, what would be the risk of not finding out about those who are asymptomatic but uh, have been infected? Or, or what's to gain in finding out that they're affected and infected? And since the virus is so virulent, do we run the risk of having a large number of people to quarantine mm -hmm. as we continue to test? So the couple, couple both <laughs> multifaceted question. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and certainly, it's, we, we, we've been doing this for so long, there's the temptation because of fatigue just to say, all right, you know, let's stop this. But here are some, some, some reasons, facts that we look at. First, vaccination. Um, when we first saw Omicron, and I first saw it late in, in the December part, among healthy, some of our healthiest students um, who were fully vaccinated, and I saw them coming in symptomatic. So that was the first signal that, hey, you know what? Being vaccinated may not be enough. What do we know? If you're vaccinated, the effectiveness right now of, Del of um, Pfizer or Moderna just from two doses is down around 30%. That's extremely low. That's almost like not being vaccinated, right? The booster shots gets that back up to 70 or 80%. The question that we should ask a little bit is what's the value of any single life? to us. And again, when it's my students, when it's the children especially who are not vaccinated, any one of them um, is a precious life and we should do what we can to protect it. So it's a risk to benefit, but it's an exchange. When you have kids in a dorm and you're not testing, if that gets loose in that dorm, you can't react fast enough, right? You'll still have, and I want to just point out, just because you don't die doesn't mean you can't get sick, right? So they still get pretty flu symptoms and mm -hmm. you know when you look at kids in, and we have an early learning center here we have a middle school in kids dehydration is still a problem you know I had a chance to look at the numbers in children's hospital next door to us and when you see those it's it's a signal to me to say we're not ready to take our foot off the gas yet but we also can assure people this week so far and the people we've tested we're down to about five percent the nation is running in the teens right our own hospital has fallen to about 17 percent 
we're down to 5%. I'm hopeful that that is going to drop to a zone like we had last semester where we can say, okay, we know enough now to back off. Um, but we can't just back off until we know. Understood. Uh, to switch gears a bit, obviously you're overseeing the project primarily um, with Adventus uh, on the hospital. What's the status of the deal and uh, probably provide the audience with an update on uh, any work on the new hospital? Well, so there, there's, um, we're moving progress. Progress is steady. It's slow at points, but it's steady because again, this is a, to me, this is an alignment for life. This has to outlive you and me and so many others to come after us, right? We're 150 years old. I want to make sure that we're going to be 250 years old. Um, and so we're being very steady and deliberate about how we bring this together on both sides. The first side of this is Howard needs to be able to maintain its mission to serve, to teach, and educate minorities forever. At Venice has a similar mission, and they're very good at running hospitals. That they're about a clinical engine that's extremely good. So we're trying to bring those together without sacrificing either one. So having that careful a partnership takes time. So we're, we are moving, we are progress. Um, in terms of the new hospital, we, are, you know, we have plans to make that happen. We're trying to work together to put together, again, solid financing plan to make it happen because it has to be sustainable along the way. And it's not just a hospital, right? It is the core of Howard that we're talking about being able to do. And hopefully that will be an academic health center which involves training medical students. So hopefully it's not just the hospital, but we're able to put an academic complex with it to have a full-blown academic health center that will carry on beyond us. And I guess, um, you know, as we start closing, back in 2016, uh, when I interviewed you, you spoke a lot about student debt. And uh, obviously, um, Bloomberg Philanthropies gave a wonderful gift uh, to the university. Describe that gift to the audience as well as what impact has that truly had on student debt, given what the average was and what you're seeing now based on just the, the impact of that gift? So the impact was, is huge in, in a number of ways. First of all, just the amount itself went to students who had debt anywhere from $25,000 and above. So you should first know, you know, that the graduating student from medical school has debt close to $300,000, so well above $200,000. That gift allowed us to reduce debt to our graduating class by 30%. It's yeah. huge, right, per individuals. We were able to serve most of the class, right, well over 300 kids across all the classes of 475 we have. What we have seen also is others are beginning to step forward. We recently got a million dollar gift from Abbott um, to, to deal with some of our debt and to grow our students in areas that we need. So particularly we'd like to see a development in the PhD MD programs because we have such again a, uh, a dearth of African American or minority physicians in the clinician scientist arena and that's what makes a difference right if you think about the vaccines clinician scientists work together to develop the vaccines we don't have enough minorities so having people step forward and say hey we want to give in our way so to develop that program to get that gift we're seeing others come forward mm -hmm. to because we got that first gift to begin to contribute as well it's extremely exciting and I think as at Claude, you've been here now um, since 2015. You've navigated uh, a hospital that was losing significantly. The hospital has now been in the black. You're working on this new arrangement, lowering student debt, increasing number of applications to the medical school. As you uh, look down the road for the SBP, what are some of the things that uh, we should be excited about seeing coming out of uh, this new role and, and your office? I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm excited about two things. One is the opportunities that are coming up to really build science. Right? So again, we're, we're, we're looking at um, other agents getting together with us to look at building innovation pro products. The, so the opportunity to really build science, not just at the medical school level, but across the campus, and to do it in an innovative way, to leverage things that are new sciences, meaning proteonomics and, and things like um, metabolomics. They have all the omic names to them. But our larger institutions around the country are already participating in this. And we need to catch up again. We have all the tools we need. We don't necessarily have all the resources that we need to make that happen. So spending time to build that out and making Howard known 
and be a partner in how to do that is, is one of the more exciting things that I, that I see. And the second one is getting it back into the community. That's gonna be the trick. How do we make, have better physicians pulling together resources that they need and Howard being able to be sort of the, the underpinnings of that, the foundations to help physicians in communities that usually don't get relief. They're solo physicians, bringing knowledge to them and making that accessible so we have better care. So those are two of the things that I'm excited about and looking forward to being able to do in this new role. Excellent. Well, I certainly thank you for the role that you've played thus far. You've been an integral part of uh, my leadership team. And I want to thank you for being here. My guest today was Dr. Hugh Mighty, Howard's new Senior Vice President of Health Affairs and outgoing Dean of the College of Medicine and Vice President of Clinical Affairs. I'm Dr. Wayne Frederick. Please join me next time on The Journey. This program was produced by WHUT and made possible by contributions from viewers like you. For more information on this program or any other program, please visit our website at whut.org. Thank you.